let's get to the next. And what I thought was really quite interesting is that this session, um, if you had done this session a year ago, I think it would have been focused on PIs and IMIDs, which are uh, the backbones of therapy in myeloma. And I think um, it's a tenement to the work of this community that we now have a third backbone. And I think that that third backbone are the monoclonal antibodies. Uh, so to start off with, again, I want to thank our hosts for a, a lovely meeting and a lovely venue. Um, and uh, I never completely understood why it's the City of Lights until last night. Now I understand. Um, but, uh, but again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. So what I want to talk a little bit about is give you uh, some of the insights into antibody-based therapy and talk a little bit about immunotherapy. And I think of immunotherapy as not being one thing, but potentially three different things. And I think this is an important way to try and distinguish between passive immunity, which I'm going to focus on most of today, which is monoclonal antibodies. And I would argue they are truly targeted therapies because it's a, uh, an antigen on the surface of a plasma cell that you're targeting targeting with an antibody. Uh, adjuvant uh, therapy, which is really the use of peptide or dendritic cell vaccines, uh, as well as active therapy, which is allotransplant, CAR T cells, or other active immunity-based approaches. And I think the advantage of, of antibody-based therapy, again, that it is very well targeted. The disadvantage of this approach has been what I call connecting flights. And so I live in Atlanta. And so every flight uh, from pretty much anywhere in the U.S. comes through Atlanta uh, one way or another. And so if you're coming from Boston and you want to go to Florida, you have to come through Atlanta. And the way that you usually do that is you take one plane, takes you to Atlanta, you get on another plane, go from Atlanta to Florida. The problem is that if you think about this as being a connecting flight, the vaccine is that first flight from Boston to Atlanta. But if the immune system is not ready to take that vaccine and go one step further and make antigen-specific T cells, it's like getting stuck in Atlanta, meaning that the flight is not ready for you and the vaccine is not going to be very effective. Now, I'll tell you that's the nice part about living in Atlanta is you never get stuck in Atlanta. Um, but, uh, but for many others who have to connect, that can be a problem. And I think that's why we failed with this approach for so long. We now have drugs, and I'm going to talk about them towards the end, that may help get that plane ready so that you can then get on that next flight to respond. And finally, uh, in terms of uh, active therapy, there certainly are significant off-target effects and long-term durability of those effects uh, certainly are important questions uh, for us to address as well. So as we've had such great data over the last few days talking about all the improvements in progression-free and overall survival, the question that uh, popped up probably in many industry uh, colleagues' uh, heads many years ago is why do we need antibodies in myeloma? We clearly have had significant improvements. And many would argue that the next wave of improve, uh, improvements in myeloma are going to be using mutation-driven therapy, whether it's KRAS, NRAS, P53, using that information to come up with approaches. But the reality is that antibodies do represent a way potentially to be what I call risk agnostic. And that is, it doesn't matter what the aberrant signaling within a cancer cell is. If you can target it extracellularly through an immune response, you may be able to overcome some of those high-risk features that we typically see in patients with high-risk or even relapsed myeloma. So when we think about using antibodies in the context of myeloma, I think that the goals of therapy are dependent on where you are in a patient's disease course. So if you have a patient with refractory relapse, all you really want to do is get a PR. That's really all you care about. I want to reduce the amount of burden of myeloma in that patient's body so that I can ultimately improve progression-free and we hope ultimately overall survival. But if you're looking at a patient with relapse disease, you do want to target the tumor, but you also want to allow some level of restoration of normal immune function. So the role of an antibody may be different depending upon the situation in which you're treating them. If you're treating a newly diagnosed patient with an antibody, your goal is to get them to MRD negativity. These are things that we couldn't do with, with high frequency before the availability of monoclonals and control clonal evolution. So again, a, a third goal or a concept in terms of why antibodies may be important. And again, if you're in the pre-malignant state, and we heard a great session on smoldering and MGUS earlier today, your goal is to prevent conversion to myeloma and potentially to target the microenvironment. So allow that difference in immune function that probably represents a major shift from smoldering to symptomatic myeloma, prevent that from happening. And this concept, I think, is a really important one because as you can see, based on where the patient is in their life cycle, you have very different goals for antibody-based therapy.
Now we have a number of different targets in, in antibodies and what you can see in blue here are the targets that are currently in clinical trials. What you can see in green are potential targets that are being evaluated and in orange targets with clear preclinical activity and BCMA should probably be blue now because there are trials looking at BCMA, BCMA based CAR T cells. Uh, and so I think these are certainly very exciting. The ones I'm going to focus on today are CD38, SLAM F7 and then talk a little bit about PD1 as we go forward as well. So as we know, when you're using a monoclonal antibody, the concept is really uh, one of three different major mechanisms of, uh, of effector cell. Uh, there can be ADCC, CDC, or you can have direct inhibition of cell survival through, inner, uh, through uh, signaling, uh, and CD38 is a great example of that because we know CD38 is an important survival signal for plasma cells as you go forward. But I want to do, and this is the first time I've used this slide, so it may not quite work the way I want it to. But Let's see. I think it's important to realize that our image, as we heard in the last lecture, actually have two different types of effects. The first thing they do is obviously they target the plasma cell itself, and they do this through targeting Cerebron, which then results in downstream down regulation of IRF4 and MYC. And when you do this directly through targeting the plasma cell, you result in myeloma cell death. That's a good thing. However, at the same time, that same drug, the IMIDS, target Cerebron, the same target in B cells or T cells and NK cells, which then results in downregulation of Icarus and Iolios, and at the same time upregulates IL-2 and downregulates TNF. So the same target is present both in the malignant cell and in the immune cell, but results in very different effects. And this, concept's, uh, this concept allows us to think about reutilizing IMID agents, even though the tumor cell may be resistant, you may still get the immune-mediated effects. And this, I think, is really important as we think about treating or retreating patients with monoclonals in combination with immunomodulatory agents. So let's start off with SLAM F7. We know that SLAM F7 is a target that's present, present uh, almost ubiquitously on plasma cells, and it's also present on NK cells. But it's important to realize that the mechanisms between these two cells are actually quite different, and it has to do with intracellular signaling. If you look at plasma cells, SLAM F7 is not associated with signaling through E2, which means that all that SLAM F7 does on a plasma cell is target it for immune recognition. There is no activation or inhibition of signaling within the malignant plasma cell when you target SLAM F7 with elotuzumab. On the other hand, SLAM F7 is present on NK cells, and because of E2-mediated signaling, it then activates these NK cells, which are then more potent immune effector cells over time. And so this cartoon really sort of speaks to that in a different way. When you bind elotuzumab on an NK cell, you activate that NK cell to then be a more effective anti-tumor uh, effector cell to a cell that's been tagged or targeted with elotuzumab as you go forward. So dual mechanism of action is an important difference. Now we know that there is synergy with both bortezomib and with lenalidomide in terms of preclinical models with elotuzumab. Again, through different mechanisms, in my, in my idea, the synergy with an IMID through its anti, uh, its uh, immune effector effect of lenalidomide is really quite potent. And this synergy is what led us to do the very first phase one, phase two clinical trial of elotuzumab in combination with lenalidomide and dexamethasone. And as you can imagine, that first trial, we saw 82% of patients respond in aggregate with about 95% of patients responding who were naive to prior exposure to lenalidomide. This then gave rise to a randomized phase two trial looking at dosing of elotuzumab, 10 mg per kg versus 20 mg per kg. And again, as you can see here, response rate and duration of response was actually much higher in the 10 mg per kg group than in the 20 mg per kg group, although statistically these were not significant. 10 mg per kg is what was used for subsequent phase three trials going forward over time. And this then led to the most recent Eloquent 2 trial. And uh, you all know the design of Eloquent 2, Elo uh, Lendex versus lenalidomide and dexamethasone. I'm going to focus on a couple of points different than what you've heard from Xavier in the previous talk. And that is not all phase three trials are the same. 
So when you compare or try to compare multiple phase three trials that are using Lendex as a backbone, it's important to realize that the patient populations are actually quite different in each of these three trials. And what I'm going to show you, at least in the Eloquent trial, is that if you look at patients with cytogenetic abnormalities or patients with, uh, with 17P or with 414, a clearly higher percentage in this subgroup than in other trials. And remember, in, in Eloquent, every patient had central cytogenetics and FISH performed. That is not the case for every large randomized phase three trial that's been done and published in the last two years. Now, yesterday, uh, Hervé mentioned the fact that you can't really use any cutoff for 17P deletion. That's what this data actually did do initially. However, if you go back and look at IMWG criteria for high risk, a third of the patients on the Eloquent II trial met that IMWG criteria uh, using the cutoffs that are recommended by the, by the working group as well. The other piece that I think is, is unique or different about Eloquent 2 is that a third of patients were refractory at the time of study entry. This is, again, much higher than the frequency of refractoriness for other phase 3 trials that are being done in the same space. So again, it doesn't say that one trial is any better or worse. It just says it's hard to compare ag across trials because the patient populations are, in fact, quite different. And this was the data that was used last year and published in the New England Journal showing a significant benefit for patients who got LO in combination with Lendex versus patients who got lenalidomide and dexamethasone. This was improvement in progression-free survival. This was the interim overall survival data that was presented by Dr. Demopoulos uh, very recently as well. And in fact, if you take this one step further, this is actually data that I think really speaks to the difference between immune-based therapies and signaling-based therapies, and that is time to next therapy. Now, this is not the best objective measure because there are many reasons why patients may be started in the relapse setting differently on one arm versus another. But in general, you're going to see this trend coming up across the board in immune-based therapies, and that is that it appears that the use of a monoclonal antibody, particularly one that may have immunostimulatory effects, changes the, the tempo of relapse compared to what you see with signaling-based approaches. And this difference in time to next therapy really speaks to that. It's a 12-month difference in time to next therapy, which speaks to a different um, indolency of, uh, of patients at the time of relapse. Now, the other piece that I think speaks to unique aspects of immune-based therapies are what we see in terms of durability of response. And if many of you have seen presentations on melanoma, lung cancer, colorectal cancer, other tumors that are using PD-1 inhibitors, what we see is that the overall response rate may not be appreciably different, but the durability of that response is significantly longer when you use immune-mediated approaches. And this is actually can be demonstrated with elotuzumab as well. What you see here is that amongst all patients who achieved a PR, green are the patients who got ELO versus blue the patients who didn't, the durability of that PR is longer if you got the antibody. So this is equivalent responses. If you do the same with VGPR or better, again, significant prolongation of the durability of the response with an antibody that has not been shown in any other phase three trial in myeloma to date. So again, this subtle difference in terms of the immune enhancing effects, I think are really important and are somewhat unique. And then as has been presented before, 17P and 414, it looks like the, dur the, the, the benefit is clearly superior for the group that got elotuzumab in blue compared to the group that did not in gray. Now, what about reactions and infusion reactions? So this is the data from the randomized phase three trial. You can see absolute incidence of infusion reactions was about 10%. 70% uh, uh, of the infusion reactions occurred with the first dose. And elotuzumab was only interrupted in about 5% of patients due to an infusion reaction. And only two patients discontinued because of infusion reaction related effects. So again, this is a relatively well tolerated approach. And when patients ask me, well, you know, when they ask me about PI, or imids or alkylators or any other drugs, they always say, well, give me the long list of side effects. With antibodies, to be honest with you, the long list of side effects is one. It's infusion reactions. That's the most common thing you see, and I think that tends to be an early event, not necessarily a late event. 
Now let's talk a little bit about CD38 as a potential target. CD38 again is a type 2 uh, glycoprotein, highly expressed in myeloma. It does have intrinsic signaling uh, uh, enzymatic activities uh, that are important to its mechanism of action. This may be an important mechanism by which it is able to kill independently of ADCC or other immune effector functions. And again, it also is important for adhesion, proliferation, and differentiation of not just plasma cells, but other cells within the B cell lineage. And just to give you a sense of mechanism, again, CDC, ADCP, and ADCC clearly are important effects. There's a direct anti-tumor effect, but at ASH last year, we actually saw very interesting data suggesting that it too may have an immunomodulatory effect in terms of down-regulating Treg expression, as well as uh, suppressing myeloid dendritic suppressor cells as well. This, I think, is really an important potential mechanism that we're beginning to explore, and I'm going to show you some data that might at least speak to the clinical nature of some of these relapses uh, in terms of how they behave. So uh, the group uh, from Dr. Lockhorst and his colleagues did the first in man study of the Gen 501 study, which again showed significant responses. This was subsequently followed up with a, with a uh, phase two study of over 100 patients that was published last year uh, in, uh, in Lancet and actually demonstrated a significant improvement uh, for patients by waterfall plot and an objective overall response rate of about 29%. Now, if you start to look at what happened to some of these patients, you can see these are the patients that initially had quick responses. And again, quick is really the operative word. Most patients to single agent DARA responded within the first cycle, but you could actually even see improvements in response over time. And I can tell you that one of the longest responders here that achieved a complete remission uh, that lasted over two years uh, progressed, came off, and is now back on DARA and is re-responding again uh, to, uh, to weekly dosing. So again, the concept of of re retreatment is an important one, as we've seen with other monoclonals and other diseases, and probably applies to what we're seeing with daratumumab as well. Now, if you start to look again at infusion-related reactions from this phase two study, it did occur in about 40% of patients, predominantly grade one or grade two, and again, 90% of these reactions occurred with the first infusion. So subsequent infusions do not appear to have a higher risk of, uh, uh, of infusion reactions, and no patients discontinued in this phase two study due to infusion-related reactions. So again, a self-limited side effect that occurs typically within the first cycle, within the first dose or two of the first cycle going forward. Now, this was an update of the survival data between the Gen 501, the original Phase 1, and the Phase 2 serious trial that I showed you earlier. And what this shows is sort of uh, natural history of overall survival amongst these patients. And it's always a little bit tough to show us a survival curve of responders versus non-responders, because non-responders almost always do very poorly. But what I want you to think about is the light blue curve and the purple curve here. Because if you look at the light blue curve, these are patients that did not get a PR or better. And you can see their median survival was about 17.5 months. Now, these are patients who'd had five prior lines of therapy and didn't have uh, many other treatment options available. They were refractory to an IMID and refractory to a PI at the time of study entry. And so the concept that these patients with minimal response actually had a very prolonged overall survival speaks to some of that immune modulatory effect of CD38, that the course of their subsequent relapse may have been different than what they had prior to study entry, suggesting this may be, in fact, an effect on Tregs and other immune effectors that are known to potentially enhance uh, 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 clonal expansion and growth of tumor over time. Now, similar to what I showed you earlier, with elotuzumab, it's pretty clear that lenalidomide also enhances the efficacy of daratumumab. This is in vitro data, looking at both lens-sensitive and lens-resistant myeloma cell lines. And again, this, to my mind, speaks to that context of the effect of an image may be twofold, the direct tumor effects and the immune effects, which may allow you for overcoming resistance in the context of an immunomodulatory agent. And again, uh, is the efficacy of the image really dependent on what we we talked about earlier, it's not just a tumor cell effect, it is its independent effect, and these may actually enhance ADCC independent of the anti-myeloma effects that you see. 
And this was really uh, not necessarily demonstrated in this trial, but certainly this is the combination of DARA with Lendex, sort of building on that context of IMID plus an antibody in combination. Overall response rate of 81% with about two-thirds of patients achieving a VGPR or better uh, in a phase two study. Very, very encouraging phase two data. This is now being followed up with a randomized phase three trial, and we hope we'll see responses over time. This again gives you that swimmer lane plot concept of very quick responses, and that depth of response can improve even after uh, 10 to 12 months. You can see this patient went from a PR to a stringent CR over the course of 14 months. That durability and build up over time is really an important part of what you see in some of these immune-based approaches and again very nice progression-free survival as well. To me, one of the most important trials I think that has been reported in the last few years is this trial combining DARA plus pomalidomide and dexamethasone. And just to give you a sense of why I think that this is such an important trial, these are patients with a median of four prior lines of therapy. The, the, remember, POMDEX alone in this patient population gives you a response rate of 30%. DARA alone in this patient population gives you a response rate of about 30%. When you put them together, 71% overall response rate and almost half the patients achieve VGPR or better. And I'll tell you at our center, we put about 20 patients on this trial and, and almost all of the patients at our center were 17P or other high risk patients. And the, the response, uh, overall response and durability of response is really quite striking. And I find this to be one of the more potent response res uh, regimens we have in myeloma at this time point. Again, similar swimmer lane plots from an early follow up on this trial and progression free survival that looks pretty good as well for a relapse refractory trial. Now the other CD38 that's out there that has a fair amount of data is the SAR compound or esituximab. Again, another anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. This is data from the phase one that shows again roughly about a 30 to 37 percent response rate at the, uh, at the dose that they're moving forward. 10 mg per kg given every two weeks. Uh, and of course, just like uh, you can combine any other antibody with Lendex, you can combine the SAR or esituximab with Lendex as well. And again, you see a significant improvement in overall response rate, and many of these patients were in fact resistant to lenalidomide at the time of study entry, allowing you to potentially overcome drug resistance. Now what I'm going to end with is a couple of slides on the use of PD-1 inhibitors in myeloma. And this is data that was presented again very recently at ASH this year. PD-1 and PDL one as single agents in myeloma have no activity. You get nothing when you give these drugs alone. But again, the same concept of the immune mediated effects of an IMID in combination with, uh, with a PD-1 inhibitor, and in this case, pembrolizumab. This is data that uh, Professor San Miguel presented just a few months ago at ASH showing a significant response rate for Pen, uh, Pembro plus Lendex. And remember, 50% of patients in this trial were resistant to Lendex at the time of study entry, sort of validating that concept of immune-enhancing uh, effect of an IMID with an anti-PD-1 antibody. Uh, this uh, is uh, Ashraf Badros' data combining Pembro with pomalidomide. And again, 60% overall response rate in all patients, 55% amongst double refractory, and 50% amongst patients with high-risk genetics. This is a real concept. There are phase three trials now looking at pembrolizumab and nivolumab, both targeting PD-1, as well as DERVA, which is targeting PDL one These trials are rapidly being rolled out in combination with IMID agents, I think, to really prove and hit home once again that this concept of an IMID in combination with a monoclonal is really quite good. So what's the future direction of monoclonal antibodies? Well, in Chicago, they say you want to vote early and vote often. It's the same way with antibodies. I think you're going to use them early, and I think you're going to use them at every line of therapy going forward. We obviously need the trials to be able to support that. Retreatment versus switching classes of antibodies, I think, are important questions. If you think back to that first slide that I showed you in terms of what you expect to get based on where a patient is, it may help you to think about what antibody targets you use at what specific time. And again, in the setting of MRD, uh, the ability to allow normal immune recovery may be a way to reverse immunosuppression that we see at the time of diagnosis or as a consequence of therapy, particularly long-term dexamethasone-based approach. This to me is really exciting about uh, antibody-based therapy and may provide us a less immunosuppressive way to maintain patients over time. And with that, I'll stop and take questions.